Shabbat Shalom, everybody, and welcome to HFF Online this weekend. Uh, we pray that your Sabbath is going well, that you're enjoying your time with your family here in Norman. Uh, we've got beautiful temperatures, beautiful weather. Spring has sprung, and it's with great anticipation we're looking forward to the spring feasts that are coming shortly. Uh, with me today is a close personal friend of mine, one of my teachers. Uh, I would consider him a, a expert in the element of the temple uh, studies, especially from a messianic perspective, uh, Rico Cortez of Wisdom and Torah. Rico, how are you doing today, brother? Hey, Chris, how are you, my friend? Um, I'm happy to be with you, buddy. Yes, I, we're very glad to have you, and uh, we're gonna today. We're gonna go through kind of a joint conversation, a joint study, looking at the book of Leviticus. Uh, it is this week's Torah portion reading for the annual cycle. Uh, we just wrapped up the book of Exodus, and with the the conclusion of Exodus, we see that God takes the Hebrew people out of slavery. He then takes them to Sinai. He attempts to speak to them. Uh, we see that they're fearful of, of the voice of the Lord, and they send Moses up to the mountain to meet with him. Uh, the Ten Commandments are given, the framework of the constitution of the nation of the Israelites, the Hebrew people. And while Moses is meeting with God, the Hebrew people go ahead and build an idol, the golden calf. They begin to try to worship that while Moses is on the mountain with the true God. And immediately after that covenant was, was started, the documents were given, they're already breaking the covenant with God. And so we see that Moses uh, can't even enter the presence of God in the tent of meeting because of this sin. And so we start out the book of Leviticus where God is actually calling to Moses. He's calling to him from the tent of meeting He's reminding him of the principles, and he's laying the law down with the framework of purity, sacrifices, and other key elements to executing God's perfect order in his kingdom and his nation. So, Rico, uh, you know, tell us a little bit uh, about the laying out of the framework um, when God is calling to Moses and instructing him on how the children of Israel shall approach uh, him, how the structure of the priesthood. There's, there's just a lot of things that are there and it, with the sacrifice uh, the sacrificial system that they have, and why is this important for for us today in our current messianic movement? Okay, great. Uh, you know, one of the things that happens in the study of the Bible is the confusing perspective of the temple, the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the priesthood. You know, I, and before I answer that question, I want to show you where I get my resources from. Um, I quote from Jacob Milgram. He spent 50, he spent 50 years uh, studying the book of Leviticus. He's a rabbi and also um, did a great job explaining them. I also uh, read from Mary Douglas, Purity and Danger. She's a pioneer in anthropolo uh, anthropology in regards to understanding contagion and uh, the influence of um, uh, what happens when you, the temple, what it really meant uh, from a different perspective of, you know, ancient and Eastern history. Then we have another literature from her, uh, Leviticus as Literature, all these books are very pivotal to understand, you know, exactly what's going on today, Chris, in regards to the quarantine and things like that. There's one more book, a few more books I want to share with you before I get into this. Because, Chris, I think it's important that when we study this, as I explain it, I want you to know where I get it mm -hmm. from. Uh, Jonathan Clowans, he does a really great job explaining about, you know, what is called symbolism and uh, uh, the study of ancient uh, Israel, purity, sacrifices, and the temple. Uh, he puts it in the perspective of culture and what it meant back then. And also, two of the volumes from the Mishnah, and I'm going to show you to you why it's important. The Mishnah was written by, uh, speci specifically, uh, uh, it's the legal rulings of what, everything that went on in the temple. And in this particular uh, uh, volume specifically, it talks about what is called corpse impurity. Mm -hmm. It talks about uncleanliness. It talks about somebody, someone being contagious, in this case, with sin or transgression. And how would you go about it? And that leads me into exactly what I'm going to go into to answer some of your questions. Okay, so the number one premise of the book of Leviticus, really, is to enter into God's presence again. So when you study, Chris, the whole idea of the Lord is to bring us back to the garden. That's the main theme in the whole Bible. 
okay, is to return to the mm, garden. Yeah. Adam was created for a purpose, to multiply and be fruitful and to expand the garden, to expand the garden from inside out. And then we get a picture of this when we study the tabernacle, Chris, because it starts constructing it from the inside mm -hmm. out, from the Holy of Holies, yep. the Ark of the Covenant, outward, right? That's exactly how the Lord wants to start in our lives, from our hearts outward, mm -hmm. circumcision of the heart towards our yep. bodies. So the whole idea of Exodus and Genesis, and this is really important for our teaching today, is that Genesis and Exodus chapters 39 and 40, in reality, are bookends mm -hmm. to the master plan of God. He wants to restore Israel to the garden. So the tabernacle is a microcosm of the millennial reign and the garden Emmanuel, God with us. He dwells among us again. Mm -hmm. And then he gives Israel the duty to expand the garden and to fulfill the blessing to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. To be a blessing to all the nations of the earth so that all the nations of the earth will receive the good news. Hey, good news, yeah. guys. We can return to the garden. Death if is defeated. Now we can return as a new creation. Okay. With that being said... Leviticus takes a very important position in our lives. It should be because as we read in the last Torah portion in the book of Exodus, which ended with the kavod, the glory of God dwelling in his tabernacle, that is the enthronement ceremony. God reigns and rules again on mm -hmm. the earth. Israel has welcomed and ushered um, the kingship of God again on the earth. Now, the problem is, the text tells us, that Moses cannot officiate. Mm -hmm. He cannot do anything. They didn't know what to do. So the Lord then calls out to, a, to Israel. And if you really read the verse, you know, it tells you something very significant. It says, and, and the Lord said to Moses, speak to the children of Israel. And I'm going to read it to you because I think it's very important. It says, many of us, we read these verses, but we never connected with the previous Torah portion, Chris, mm -hmm. and we lose yeah. the essence of what he's trying to convey. Mm -hmm. It's like, for example, you, you like, for example, uh, when you met your wife, April, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden now you got to know her. But then when you married her, the process of getting to know began. Mm -hmm. You know, then you have to have a conversation. You have to know how to, you know, how to deal with one another on the everyday basis for relationship, for intimacy, yeah. for any kind of conversation. Well, guess what? The Lord requires relationship between us and him. Well, how would we be able to deal with the holiness of mm -hmm. God? When Moses, the holiest guy in the yeah. whole camp, and the priests, the holiest people in the whole camp, cannot even go into the presence of the Lord. Think about that. Yeah. Now. Imagine, Chris, if the story would have ended right there. Let's say that the book of Leviticus was not written. Then how can we ever fellowship yep. with this God so great to be behold? And the Leviticus 1 says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and spoke to him. He called Moses and spoke to him, said, From the tabernacle of meeting, from his throne, says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offerings of the livestock, of the herd, and of the, of the, and of the flock. Now, I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but the whole premise is the Lord now says, I'm ruling among you. Mm -hmm. I'm your king. For now, I want to have fellowship with you. Let me tell you how you approach me. Let me tell you how you, how you come before me. Yes, I am holy, but you can still be sanctified to present yourself before me. And that's what I love about the book of yeah. Leviticus. It gives you a blueprint of fellowship, intimacy, and worship. I 100% I agree. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing when you look at the context of, of Scripture. Like you said, when you, when you go back and you read the previous Torah portion uh, and you are connecting the dots of the whole entire story, Rather than just picking up and starting at Leviticus 1 and forsaking what was the, the precursor to that time. 
And if we, if we don't utilize the precursors right. that God gives us in the entire story, we're, we're missing huge elements of that. We're, we're basically using the scripture in a manner it was never intended to be. We're using it in a way that we want it to be. When God has given us those stories and all of this in a cyclical fashion for us to ultimately understand his plan. His, like you said with my wife, and Amen. it's a love story. It really is a love story of a creator who loves his right. creation. Pretty much. And, I mean, think about that. You know, we're, we're starting with Leviticus and we're talking about the fact that, you know, God could have, um, he could have stayed at Sinai. You know, he could have said, you know, okay, Israel, you're now a nation. Here's the framework for you to be a nation. You go here and, you know, once a week or twice a week or whatever he decided, you, you come back to this mountain and, and you meet me here. But he laid a framework that he could dwell with his people so they could experience just how magnificent he was in, in the midst of them. I mean, how, how cool yeah. is that? That's, that's, and I mean, that, Chris, that's overwhelming to me to think that the creator of heaven and earth requires holiness, but opens the way to approaching mm -hmm. him. But he teaches us in the process awe, reverence, respect, mm -hmm. honor, holiness. Now, let me, if I may, let me share something that I think we miss about and I'm going to use modern day what's happening today okay. around us uh, to convey this message, okay? Right now, we are in a whole shutdown in so many places, so many countries. Now, the whole world, last Shabbat, they, they were forced to keep yeah. Shabbat, okay? Now, people don't want to wash their hands before they sit at the table uh, for Shabbat dinner. But last, last, this, ha this whole week, we've been forced to wash everything all the time. Now, it's exactly where they get it from. It's from temple mm -hmm. service because that's the one thing that kept the children of Israel alive through the bubonic plague, to the, you know, uh, all those things in the Middle Ages. Now, watch this. The issue that we're having today and the reason why we're suffering what we're suffering today in America almost to economic collapse is because the world is completely oblivious to what Leviticus mm -hmm. tells us. Because you see, values is what defines a nation, a nation. The whole book of Leviticus is all about are all about mm -hmm. values. It's trying to teach us about, about the values of God. Okay, so what is holy to the Lord? What is clean mm -hmm. to the Lord? What is a proper behavior of sex between yep. two people? How do you treat one another? I, I mean, okay, like, let me ask you a question. You go to a work meeting or you work to an interview, you go to an interview, and the first thing you do, you take a shower, you get all dressed up to present yourself adequately to go meet someone yep. you don't know. But when we talk about these principles from the temple perspective, and yet we call ourselves the temple of God, we never understand that 45%, now think about this, 279 commandments in the Torah. There are 613, 279 of them deal with the temple mm -hmm. directly. So 45% of the commandments, Chris, deals yep. with the temple, the feast, the priest, clean, unclean, food, and all that stuff. The values of the Far East are affecting us mm -hmm. today, even in our pockets in the economic sector. Now think about this. Israel, however, is supposed to be a kingdom with values established by God mm -hmm. himself. He's saying, I want you to be an example of holiness. So let me tell you how you do it. Now, do you know that the Torah... It's a very unique document. It's to the extent that in the ancient world, and I say ancient Eris, you know yeah. me now for a long time, and I've been saying that word a lot, but it's so pivotal to understand because in the ancient Near East, in the ancient world, when the world of the Bible was written, okay, the, the gods, or what they think perceived as the gods, the ancient kingdoms, they never knew how to please mm -hmm. the gods. In other words, they will serve this god yep. Baal, Asherah, or the gods of the Egyptians, but they never knew how to yep. please them. But the Torah is the only document that specifically tells you exactly what God requires yep. of us so that we know psychologically what pleases him, what it doesn't please him. So guess what? Yep. We don't have to guess. You know, oh, how I love to do your will, O oh Lord, for your law is in my yep. heart. You see what I mean? So it, it, the book of Leviticus be, should be 
the center and the pivotal point to the point that I was listening to a Christian pastor, doctor, by the way, the other day, this week, as we go into the whole coronavirus thing. And he made this statement. He said, clean animals, you may get sick through a bacteria, through clean, permissible animals in the mm-hmm. book of Leviticus. But you're not, and you may die from the bacteria, but you're not going to pass on yep. the virus. However, on clean animals that the Bible talks about, not only you can die from the bacteria, but then you'll be able to, contagi- to be contagious with the yep. virus of somebody else. Now think about that for a minute. That's really powerful, knowing that the Lord says not to eat those things in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, in talking to some of my friends who are, uh, who are in the medical field, um, you know, some of the most dangerous viruses or bacterias that exist are the ones that uh, originally start out uh, in, in a human body, uh, where we already have antibodies built up to these things, whether it's from the washing of hands or cleanliness or whatever. But then they're transferred into animals they mutate, so they're not in their original right. form, and then we consume those animals and we bring it back into our body. Well, this is, this is very much one of the most right. common uh, talked about elements of our current issues we're dealing with right now is that the unclean animals that have been eaten uh, were, were, in theory, they had this mutated form, <coughs> and when it was ingested back into the body, our bodies did not have antibodies for that. And this is important for us to understand because, right. you know, we have, we have a third of the world's religion right now are, are considered to be Christians and a part of Christianity. And one of the, the major uh, talking points of Christianity is the fact of the vision in which God declared all things to be clean. And we have that, that that's, a, that's a very common teaching right now. And, and there are there's some scholars in, in Christianity right now who are taking a different approach to that and, and having different, more open conversations. But as a whole, that is a very common concept that is taught in Christianity. Well, the problem with that is what, right. what they're then saying is that sometime throughout history, throughout the time of the ancient world to our modern Midwest world that we have right now in our Western culture, that, that God changed that somehow by changing how creation worked that creation somehow completely changed. Well, right. there's nothing in the scripture to back that up, and there's no authority in the scripture that God gives us to make that change on our own. And so this is one of the reasons why when, when we look at how the ancient Near Eastern concept works with our modern Midwest concept of today, it's very relevant for every area, even considering what you were talking about with the temple and the purity of the people to be able to be clean and be with a holy God. Well, if we take the concept that we are now the right. temple, our body is the current temple on this earth. Obviously, there's not a temple in Jerusalem right now that's, that's freestanding with brick and mortar. So if we're the temple, then the application of the cleanliness of the temple still applies to us today. And those principles and those parables that are talked about, they're absolutely relevant for how we keep our temple clean so that the Lord can come and dwell with us. And if we continue to use just our knowledge, just the knowledge, then what we're doing is we're working on our mind not our heart, which means we're not doing what Leviticus tells us to do inside the very temple that God has given us today. Right. You know, you you were mentioning about the way the system of religion uses Acts chapters 10 in Mm -hmm. regards to Cornelius, Mark chapter 7 in regards to the foods permitted, Acts chapters 15. Now, I'm going to read you something really quickly from this book, Purity, Sacrifice, and the Temple. Because if... I'm going, to, I'm going to make this statement, and then I'm going to read this. And, and this is the core essence of the book of Leviticus, by the way. The book of Leviticus is dealing with moral behavior. And this is why in sins involving uh, moral sin, mm-hmm. like adultery, idolatry was considered spiritual adultery and murder. And also uh, fornication is in the context of sexual mm-hmm. ritual sex. Uh, sexual ritual goddess and things like that, that is considered moral moral sin, homosexuality, morality, uh, and things like that, okay? So what we miss is the fact that the temple 
the people officiating, uh, uh, and the high priest in this case, not the temple itself because mm -hmm. the temple was holy. And when God declares something holy, it's always holy. The, the mm -hmm. office is holy. The people can be corrupt. So in, in the book right here is something really cool that it says in page 177 that I have highlighted because it's so significant. It says, the second temple may have been morally corrupt, but it was not morally mm -hmm. impure. Now, let me expand on that because the people officiating, it's like saying a pastor fell in sin so the whole mm. congregation is sinful. That's not necessarily the case. The leader, now think about this, the leader sinned in a moral behavior which brings shame yep. to the whole community, but that doesn't mean that the whole community was morally yes. impure. You follow? And, and we don't really understand the differences when it comes to the temple. We say, well, the high priest Ananias and Caiaphas were morally corrupt. Th that eliminates the whole service altogether, and that is not true. So watch this. Let me read this. It says, in page 176, it says, um, impurity, impurity and sin in ancient Judaism. It says, I demonstrated that the rabbis continue to be interested in the notion of mm -hmm. moral defilement. It's also demonstrated that from them, unlike the Qumran sectarians. So let me, let me move on a little bit more. It says, uh, it says, in their view, moral impurity was caused primarily by the sins explicitly so described in the Hebrew Bible. Idolatry, sexual sin, and murder. To this short list, the rabbis also added from time to time all the things that are abominations, mm -hmm. okay? So the Bible is quite simple. God is trying to uh, separate himself from the behavior of the nations in how to worship him. In other words, let me give you an example. I'm going to go here to a PowerPoint. I want to show you something, okay? And I want to show you this real quick. Okay, the pagans regularly... They set food and drink mm -hmm. on their God's table. Well, if you read Psalms 50, God tells them, say, wait a minute, do I need your food to survive? So what did God do? He yep. gave the food to the priests. He gave the, the food for them to eat so that no one would say that, um, that the, God, the God of Israel is eating the food like the nations. And that, by the way, this is the reason why none of the food mm -hmm. was ever eaten anywhere near the altar yep. or inside the shrine, ever. The priestly family banned all food rites inside the shrine. The next point is, thus all food gifts brought as sacrifice were are conspicuously removed from the tent, the Lord's, uh, you know, the domicile where he lives, thereby erasing any suspicion that Israel's God mm -hmm. consumed the sacrifices. So yeah. read Psalm 50 when you see that. No honey, leaven, sacrifices were done at night. Why? The only sacrifice that it was in the night mm -hmm. was the Passover. But nothing can be sacrificed at night. Why? Because of the worship of the under gods, underworld gods, the, 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 mm -hmm. the gods of the dead. Temples, now, this is the important one. Temples, according to the ancient mind, ancient mindset, was defiled mm -hmm. by demonic powers. Now, this week's Torah portion, Chris, in chapters 4, if you understood the temple service, you will get it. It took me a while, but I finally understood what defiles the temple is not the demonic powers. What defiles the temple was mm -hmm. the sin of Israel. That's why you needed to purge the yep. altar. That's why you need to sprinkle the blood on the altar. Now, what does that mean to us today? That's why Paul uses the language uh, I'm sorry, the book of Hebrews and in Peter, it's only the word sprinkled by the blood is found certain times mm -hmm. in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews and also in 1 Peter. That's what we have been, it's a metaphor. He's, he's writing and saying, you have been sprinkled by the blood of Messiah. Now, where does that come from? It comes from the Exodus experience when the, well, when the worship uh, calf was, ex uh, was done in the mountain and Moses took half of the blood and then he took, he sprinkled on half of the people and on the altar. Now, that event, it is significant and redefines the ancient world's perspective yeah. of worship. Because now we don't have to be afraid mm -hmm. of demons. You, can, you see, the Bible omits them. The Torah omits them because it yep. represented chaos. God's people are order. They're in the realm of order. So therefore, if you commit sin... If you do some a transgression against the Lord, 
All you need to do is repent, bring an animal. The blood now represents the covenantal renewal. The priest is set aside to manipulate the blood because only they can do it. And then they sprinkle it on the altar. Why the altar? It represents the authority of God. Thus, now the, rest the, 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 um, the relationship is restored. And now you have cleansed by your repentance the temple of God versus the mindset of the ancient world that it was the demons that always profane the temples. And that's why they did sacrifices, Chris. They did sacrifices in the ancient world, in the pagan religions, in order for them mm -hmm. to avert the demons. So imagine putting blood on the altar, putting blood on their images of their gods, putting blood on their temples, saying, now by the blood of this animal, this temple is protected. And the Lord says, no. What defiles my holy place, it's not the powers of things don't exist in his mind, but what defiles, what defiles the place is your behavior, moral behavior. If you sin against me, you can still come. Yeah. If you willfully sin, you cannot approach me anymore. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And, I, and I'm, I'm glad you, you went there because this is, uh, this is, you made two really big points to me that, that I see we struggle with as, as a body of believers nowadays. Uh, and that is that one, we're constantly taught and we're constantly looking at how does the Bible tie to our personal testimony, our personal walk. And in doing so, we've left out one big element, and you kind of hit on that, that the book of Leviticus really outlines. And that is, is that, yes, we are to look at how God has outlined for us to walk in his obedience and find his favor through that, those purities and those commandments. However, we cannot forsake the fact that it's also given for the greater community, for the whole group of the believers, so that when they're fellowshipping together, that you're not forsaking another individual. You teach on this with righteousness and justice as well, and you kind of taught on this uh, in a statement earlier where you were talking yeah. about the shame and how, and honor and shame and how those things tie together. If we are to take the Bible and apply that to ourselves and for whatever reason and how I want to deem that interpretation, I am then causing you when we gather together to, to be in not right standing with God because of my interpretation. I'm not looking mm -hmm. at the Torah or the Bible or the commandments of God in the whole picture. There's the personal aspect, but there's the right. community aspect and the temple and the tabernacle and all of these things right. in Leviticus are for the community as well. And we forsake that a lot, unfortunately, with Sabbath key keeping gatherings because we do want to make it about ourself or our interpretation or through Midrash. Uh, we we want to argue points and we forget the fact <clears throat> that especially on Sabbath and when they had those gatherings, the feasts and, and when the temple was there and they were gathering at the temple, it wasn't about just you. It was about the whole nation, all of God's no. children. And we really do need to remember right. that. The other thing that you brought up there towards the end yeah. that I really want, I want you to, I want you to expound on this because uh, I think this is something very crucial for the one third of the, 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 general religion in the world, the, the Christianity being one third of the, the major religions that are there. A lot of people still struggle with how the book of Leviticus, especially the sacrificial system and the ritual purities that are there for the priesthood, for the tabernacle, and then followed through in the temple as well, they struggle with the fact that there are offerings and there are sacrifices. And the statements are made like, well, Yeshua is our final sacrifice, or Yeshua was. However, there's a very interesting thing that, that Leviticus actually doesn't specifically talk about. And correct me if I'm wrong here. It gives multiple offerings, grain offerings, oil, flour, turtle doves, this. It gives multiple instructions for different portions of that community. If they have unintentional sin, this is how you're supposed to do. 
But I don't see in this, these passages that there is a willful sin offering. Now, a lot of times people will try to tie that back to there was a specific reason that God did not have a willful, rebellious uh, offering for sin there because the only sacrifice that could be um, even remotely capable of that type of defiance or that type of rebellion would be God himself through his son, not the father, but the son, giving his life as a spotless sacrifice for all of the willful sin, all the rebellion. Expound on on your thoughts on that for me. Perfect. Um, I have a a shot right here I want to share with you. And again, please understand that we have to be mindful of this. The number one problem that we have in the body of Messiah is that we have disregarded 45% of the Bible by not understanding Leviticus, by not understanding the tabernacle, by not understanding the priesthood, the, the feast, all that stuff. If you consider the arguments that are going on every week on almost every congregation, it's all about one of the things that involve mm-hmm. the temple. Passover is coming. They argue about the calendar. Well, that's, <laughs> that, that dealt with the, with the Sanhedrin Council, which was established in Deuteronomy 17, according to God, and it was dealt with the temple, because only the high priest can declare, declare holy the day to be observed. Mm-hmm. The new moon, the same thing. Okay, the same thing happens when it comes to the Christian world as a system. We're not attacking the people. We're just talking mm-hmm. about the system yeah. of religion. So when they talk about sacrifices on something they don't study, so I'm going to show you a, 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 a graph okay. here that outlines for us the different types of sacrifices. There were three altars, and I'm going to cover the one you just asked me. So there are three altars in the tabernacle. There's the um, the uh, the brazen um, toki. I'm sorry, the ark of mm-hmm. the covenant. That's be considered as an altar. There is the altar of incense. You can only put blood there, not any meat or any animal. Then you have the greater altar outside in the court of Israel, on uh, the court of the Levites. I'm sorry, and the priests. It's Rahana um, Kohenim, the the courtyard of the priests. Those three uh, represented three different types of offerings. Let me show you. Number one would be the Ark of the Covenant. That would cover Leviticus 16, 11 through mm-hmm. 19. Now, if you read Leviticus, you know that Leviticus 16 deals with the Day of Atonement. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay? So only the king, only the king hears the prayers of repentance on the Day of Atonement for willful, unwillful, or brazen and unrepentant mm-hmm. sin. Now, Psalms 51, and I'm going to connect this. Psalms 51 is when David willfully took the wife of yep. Uriah, and then he got a letter to send him to kill. He did it willfully, and he says, if you wanted offerings and animals, I will give it. He understood mm-hmm. that what he did, there was no offerings yep. for, but he understood the one thing, repentance. Mm-hmm. In repentance, he went to the Lord, and the Lord forgave him, but his family uh, suffered because of that forever. Now, what's interesting is that on Yom Kippur, this is the basis of the book of Hebrews. Well, sadly, only people who don't really study the temple will never get the mm-hmm. book of Hebrews. Okay, book of Hebrews was written in the context of the Day of Atonement in the year of mm-hmm. Jubilee. If you, look at, uh, if you look at Hebrews chapters 9.22, the word forgiveness of sins in, in Greek is supposed to say remission. Now, remission is completely different than a regular forgiveness of sins. And people don't know the differences of a judicial matter of sacrifices. In other words, there are different uh, transgressions and there are different degrees of uh, punishment per transgression. I mean, if you just go over the speed limit by five miles, you're not going to be thrown in jail for 20 years. You know what I mean? So murder and uh, idolatry was completely different. And adultery was completely different because it was willful. It was voluntary. It was in disregard to the commandments. It was an affront to the authority. So now you have the number one altar, in this case, the Ark of the Covenant, where the high priest will go once a year. Now, remember you were talking about the individual in the community? 
This is where the community takes a hold because the high priest not only represents himself, he represents his family, but that day alone he represented the whole of community. So the Lord still gave access to him a representative of humanity per se, or in this case, Adam. He will represent Adam. Uh, he will be the last Adam on the earth in this case, and Adam on the earth, the high priest will be, in order to represent on behalf of the nations and the people of Israel as a collective unit. That's what Yom Kippur is. That's why the book of Hebrews is presenting Yeshua as the high mm -hmm. priest in the heavenly tabernacle because now he can take our uh, repentance and now through his blood he can present it on the holy holies in the heavenly tabernacle that he did once and for all and that he's representing not only himself but everyone else uh, so to speak so that we can be in good standing with God now watch this number two the second altar you see on the screen is for involuntary communal mm -hmm. violations that's Leviticus 4 verse 13 to 21 and then you have number three which is the outer altar it says involuntary individual violations in Leviticus 4 21 to 35 now let me ask you guys a question when was the last time we looked at the book of Leviticus and understood that there are different different levels of transgression of involuntary communal involuntary individual and also national brazen on repentance violation that we have on the mm -hmm. Day of Atonement. Once I understood that breakdown, when I read the book of Leviticus, now becomes simpler because I understand there's a purpose to a particular need. For example, the Ola, or the Thanksgiving yeah. offering, you don't have to do anything wrong. It's a, it's a Thanksgiving offering. By the way, uh, praise and worship. Praise, you know that whole praise? You know where that comes from? It comes from this mm -hmm. sacrifice, the Ola, the Thanksgiving. Yep. That's when you gather together with, you brought your best to the Lord and then you present it because you're grateful and thankful that some things went the right way in your life. And you say, thank you, Lord, for everything you've given me. And now you want to just delight in him and now you praise him. So when we say, let's praise and worship, worship was actually presenting yourself to the temple the right way. Praise was the offering that you were bringing to delight yourself in him and the yeah. family with you. That's only an example of what, you know, uh, the temple sacrifices meant. And there were no sacrifices for willful, rebellious sin at all. Because remember, willful, rebellious sin involves moral mm -hmm. sin, idolatry, adultery, you know, murder, you know, uh, all yep. that stuff, right? Now, let's think about the sin of Ephraim. The sin of Ephraim in the Bible. Idolatry, adultery, murder. They did exactly what God yep. says not to do. They, they usurp the authority of the holy. Thus, God says, remove yourself from me. You have defiled my temple with moral misbehavior. Now, and, the, and I want to bring this up and I, and I give it back to you, but this is important. When you read the book of Hosea, all the prophets. When, when, the, when the Lord says, you bring your sacrifices into me as an abomination. Let me ask you a question. If you see someone, and we've done marriage counseling and things like that, and sometimes we'll deal with people who have committed adultery in their marriage. What is the behavior of the, if, if the men committed adultery on the wife, what is the behavior of the wife in regards to how she sees her husband now? She doesn't want nothing to do with him because he has transgressed willfully a covenant and an oath. Somebody needs to leave the house. Normally the house is divided. Uh, there's exile and there's division of the property and the family structure yep. suffers. That's exactly what God is trying to say. He's saying, you are bringing sacrifices to me, but you are behaving in an immoral way which represents, which you are my image, letting everybody know out there that I am unfaithful, unloyal to the covenant. If you can bring me a, a diamond ring, a woman can tell you, if you give her a diamond ring but you are unfaithful and you beat her up and you do the wrong thing, she's not mm -hmm. going to accept the ring. 
Because your behavior does not reflect in the loyalty and the love that she yeah. requires. Mm -hmm. That's really the whole bottom line. God says, don't bring me an offering if you're not living according to my instructions. Because nothing immoral can dwell in yeah. the presence of God. Let's repeat after me, guys, whoever's watching right now. Nothing immoral can dwell in the presence of God. Now go through the Gospels, and I want you to pay attention to the issue Yeshua's having. Ritual purity versus moral purity. He's not against ritual purity in the temple. He is again placing ritual purity above moral purity. Ritual purity, you just take a bath and you're good. Moral purity is different. It requires a complete change in mm -hmm. your behavior and your lifestyle. Well, Go I, ahead, I actually want to read uh, Hebrews chapter 5 for those who um, maybe haven't studied or seen that connection between the, the high priest under the line of Aaron in Leviticus and all the outlines, and then how Hebrews chapter 5 specifically for the Day of Atonement tied together. Because also in, in this Torah portion and throughout the book of, of Leviticus, we see that God then lays out the cycles for his feast days, for the significance of each feast day, and how we should do that. And so like, like with everything, you, you and I are always trying to tie everything into not only our modern world, into the context of the original world that it was written to, right. but then also trying to reflect what's happening in the spiritual realm as well as what's happening. Because we know that everything that happens and manifests itself in the physical realm is also manifesting in the spiritual realm. And so Hebrews 5, um, I think, really lays that out, specifically tying to the priesthood in the Day of Atonement, and it says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God. In order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is besieged with weakness. So this is a key difference right here that they're talking about. The difference is, is ultimately every high priest that is a, a normal man, a man that is ordained by God under the line of, of the Levitical priesthood, right. they're still human. They're still, they still struggle with the same things everybody else does, so that they, they have the ability to be weak. We see right. that with, uh, with Aaron's sons in Leviticus during this portion, too, where they're basically insulting, uh, they're insulting God and the holiness and the presence. And, and I'll kick that back to you because I, I know you've done teachings on the encroachment of the sancta, the holy place, but Aaron's sons... They, they 100% right. encroach in on the holiness just through their own weakness of saying, we can do, do this the way we want. And God's like, uh, no, it ain't going to happen. So right. the, the high priest of, right. of the human life. Because God mm -hmm. is a God of order. Because, I'm sorry, because the God is a God of order, even though he picked the priests, they still needed to submit Correct. to his way of doing worship Correct. and no, praise. I, I completely ahead, agree. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. As for the people, so also for himself. There's the individual and the community, once again. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. You have to be called by God to be the high priest. This is not something that we just, we just willy-nilly make up and say, well, I'm the high priest now. No, this establishes, just like Leviticus does, there is an order. Right. This order is established by God, and that's how you differentiate the peace of God and the chaos of this world. God is a God of order, and I know you teach that a lot. Um, right. By the way, yeah, and you know something that a verse really says in verse 2 that's very significant, which it shows you the need for Yeshua to come to the earth to suffer like we did, because God wanted to show humanity that men could defeat and live mm -hmm. according to his standards. See, that's the one thing. Yeshua lived yep. a moral life. At times he was mm -hmm. ritually impure. He was, at times he was ritually impure. He touched a dead person. He touched a leper. He touched a sick person. He was impure ritually. But morally, the Bible always mentions him as a morally upright person. So God is trying to show humanity. Hey, listen, you could do it. 
you can live according to my standards. It's not too difficult. My Torah is not so difficult that you can say, who shall come up? That's what Paul is saying in Romans chapters 10. Who shall go up to the heavens and bring it down to us? Who shall go down to the sea? It's near us. It's in our mouth. In other words, Paul is conveying the message of, guys, Yeshua defeated death that is caused by willful, rebellious, mm -hmm. moral sin. You can beat it. You have the strength if you only put your mind to it because Yeshua showed you that he was just like you and I. And yeah. uh, he's the son of God, clearly. But he was just, he suffered the same things we do and he still conquered them. In other words, come back and become the Adam that I want you to become, guys. This is very significant verses because it shows us how the high priest is supposed to be the microcosm. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be the Correct. image of God on the earth and how now the Lord is bestowing that upon us. We are now the priests Correct. and kings on the well, earth. And that you ties what I mean? right into the next, the next verse where it says, So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So ultimately, Messiah did not glorify himself to become the high priest. He didn't have the power on his own to, to claim that he was the high priest. This has to be ordained by the father, just like it was in the book of Leviticus. And so it's, right. it's, you know, it's interesting when we actually look yes. and we actually understand the context of what was going on in the ancient days. And then we turn around and we apply it even to the time of Yeshua. And we say, okay, well, hold on, wait a second. Jesus, the Messiah, a lot of people will admit Jesus was a Jew. That's not an argument that a lot of people have nowadays. But what he did and why he did it is, is still very much a, a source of, of debate and, and contention amongst a lot of believers. And here we see with Hebrews, he's, he's, not, right. he's not debating God at all. He's following in line from, from the Father as the Mashiach. And he's executing this not only in the physical realm like we mm -hmm. saw with Leviticus, but then also setting forth this in the spiritual realm under the order of Melchizedek. And so once again, like you said earlier, uh, tying uh, it all together, the heavens, the garden, how we've been impure, how we've fallen apart, how we've disobeyed and not Shema, hear the word of God to restore it all back together the way God originally intended uh, it to be. Man, I... Uh, I agree, Chris, and you know the or the book of the the book of Hebrews is so in order to the point that the letter to the Hebrews was written from Italy, chapters thirteen, verse twenty one and twenty three, was written from Italy in the context of the tabernacle during mm -hmm. the siege of Jerusalem. In other words, the temple was standing for forty years after Yeshua died yep. and resurrected. Now think about this, and during the forty years, Paul, Peter, James, uh, uh, John. None of the disciples ever mm -hmm. spoke against the feast, ever spoke against the temple, ever spoke against the sacrifices. On the contrary, Paul, if he was hastening to get mm -hmm. to Jerusalem for the feast on Pentecost. Well, wait a minute. You cannot keep Pentecost yep. if you don't observe Passover. So therefore, you got Paul celebrating Passover 40, 30 years, 20 years after Yeshua died and resurrected. So my question is, there's such utter order because the order of Melchizedek can only be officiated Correct. in the heavenly realm. Because Yeshua, in chapters 8, let me go there real quick. Chapters 8, verse 4. For if he, Yeshua, was on earth, he would not be a priest. Since they are priests who offer mm -hmm. gifts according to the law. There's such perfect order that Yeshua resurrected, and after he resurrected, he didn't just go barging into the temple after the resurrection for 40 days into the Holy Holies. How come he never said anything to the disciples, hey guys, that temple is done away with, the priesthood is done away with? Never. On the other hand, he told mm -hmm. them, no, wait until the day of Pentecost. By the way, did you know you have Correct. to bring an offering on the day of Pentecost and the first fruits, which is actually according to the book of Leviticus? So there's a, mm -hmm. there's a disconnect because the priests were sanctified and holy to the Lord in the book of Exodus and again in yeah. the book of Numbers. Okay? So therefore, Yeshua could only officiate in the heavenly tabernacle because on the earth, and I know people don't like to hear this, but on the earth, Yeshua, and I'm going to say it with full confidence, he cannot be mm -hmm. a high priest on the earth. 
because God gave that jurisdiction to the priests in the line of Aaron. Now the temple is destroyed. The priests of the line of Aaron cannot officiate in the Holy of Holies. The book of Hebrews is written during the siege of Jerusalem when the temple is being destroyed. Now he's conveying the comfort of, guys, don't worry. The connection between heaven and earth is destroyed by the Romans. Yep. No, we still have a connection between heaven and earth. The last Adam, Yeshua. Oh, by the way, God has made him a high priest to represent him in the heavenly tabernacle. Don't worry, you still have a way mm -hmm. to access him and to come before him, before him. All you need to do is behave yourself still in a moral, mm -hmm. righteous nature. Let's study ritual purity and moral purity. And that's what the book of Leviticus teaches us, the values of moral purity. And then we will understand the rest of the Bible. Put it to the test. Don't believe what I say. Look at the book of Leviticus from moral purity versus ritual purity. They're both important when the temple's standing. But in the first century, ritual purity took a greater dimension amongst the Pharisees than the moral purity. Okay? So therefore now, it was equally important, but to them, ritual purity on the everyday domain, way outside the temple mm -hmm. proper, was important. Now, Yeshua is saying, no, 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 wait a minute. What's the use of you looking perfectly on the outside, ritually, but your heart is far from me? Moral purity can be done anywhere in every domain in the world, and still the Lord would accept you. By the way, and I'll finish with this, in Cornelius, when you go to Cornelius in chapter in Acts, in the last verses of the book of Acts in chapters 10, very significant. I did a teaching on this on the first day of the tour in Israel this year. Talked about Yeshua and the whole thing. Listen to this. It says, Then he said to them, it's in Acts 10, 28. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for the Jewish men to keep company with or to go to a man of another nation. But God has shown me that I should call any man common and unclean. Now, the whole system of religion uses that chapter to say is about eating clean and unclean. Well, you want to go eat bats? Welcome coronavirus. You want to eat uh, a pig? Welcome the swine flu. Yep. You want to have, uh, you see what I mean? So now here it talks about common and unclean. Look those two words in the Greek. And you're going to notice that it's connected to moral behavior. So it's using temple language. And here, no one studies this from temple language. He only focuses on verse 9 through 13, okay, from 15. And they think it's about mm -hmm. the, all the four-footed animals. When in reality, uh, the, the vision is about Peter connecting the Correct. Romans as unclean. With the, with the animals. So it's using temple language to convey the, uh, the lifestyle of Cornelius that in chapters 10 verse 1 and 2 says, A devout man, one who feared God with his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed mm -hmm. to God always. He was a righteous man, morally upright. And God says, you don't call someone who's morally upright, right. common and unclean. Yep. I will accept them. Because ritual purity can be easily fixed. Well, I want, I want to actually tie this directly into, um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, the elements of this and why it's important. But I want to tie this into a concept that, that every American should know. And that is, is that how do things get done in our country? There are laws. There was a constitution that was written. That constitution in and of itself continues to be added upon by the people who have the authority to do so. So when you look at that, right. if they want to do away with the law. So, for example, in the last couple of years, two major things have been uh, very big issues in multi-states around America. One is the legalization of marijuana. And the other is what does the Second Amendment allow for as far as the concealed or open carry of a firearm on someone's body? So... They did not go back and abolish the laws that were in existence beforehand. What they did is every state has then passed different laws on top of the existing law that allows for either uh, medical use or some have not. Some have kept the, the original law intact. So what we see here right. is that if we're looking at from the book of John forward and what's traditionally known as the New Testament, if, if we look at that, 
Who there has the authority to add laws to the Torah? Not the apostles. So, no, so you nobody. look at that, it's like, well, wait a second, there is no authority to do that. So if Peter has a vision, Peter doesn't have the authority to go in and make a decree to add a law. So the existing law, and this is one of the things that I keep, I keep trying to hone into a lot of my friends, is that the Torah was given, and there's no place in the Bible that it says that the Torah was then taken away or a new constitution was put in. In fact, if you look at it in the conversation of ritual purity versus moral purity in Yeshua's days, Yeshua made it harder. Let me repeat that. Yeshua made it harder because when you're looking at the laws of ritual purity, God specifically outlines to you what you are to do to remain in a good status of ritual purity. It's right there in the book of Leviticus. It's in the Torah for us to figure out how to approach God. He doesn't, there's no question mark. We're not, we don't have some random made up God in a volcano that we're throwing animals or grain or money or whatever, hoping we're going right. to please that God. No, he specifically outlines to us exactly how we can maintain a ritual purity by the grace of God for us to be able to come back and meet with him through the atonement that he provides there. When Yeshua comes onto this earth and starts to teach of the Torah and starts to teach of what he what it was originally intended to be in the moral purity, it gets harder because it says, well, having sex with somebody else that is not your, your spouse in the Torah, if you engaged in the act, it's wrong. If you killed a man, it's wrong. As soon as Yeshua starts to speak about the, the moral aspect of the purity of being a person in the kingdom of God, he says, if you even think of it, it is if you created this. So a lot of times it's, it becomes very frustrating to listen to people who say, well, man, the law is legalistic or man, the law is hard. Uh, if you really are listening to the words of the Messiah Yeshua and you're actually keeping that in your life, that is harder to do. It is harder to not think about wanting to cause harm to somebody. It is harder to not think on a member of the opposite sex in a lustful way. It is harder to not even engage in the thoughts than it is to actually not do it. Right. Right, right. Well, the, the whole idea is to return to the garden mm -hmm. and represent the God of Israel as his image. And that's the whole idea, to defeat, defeat our evil yes. inclination. Yatzer Hana, Yatzer Hatov. The Jewish talk about this all the time. The good inclination, the bad inclination. Paul talks about it. The, the, um, the, uh, the what is it? Correct. Slave to sin, slave to freedom. You know, it, it, look, the biggest struggle that we have in our relationship Correct. with God is us. It's not the Bible. I mean, look, the scripture tells us exactly the instructions. It gives you examples how, how the Lord responds to how mm -hmm. people behave. I mean, the whole Torah is about, okay, you messed up, this is what I'll do to you. You obey, this is what I'll do to you. Now, you talked about the Constitution and how the Constitution and the Congress and the, and the House, uh, they mm -hmm. do amendments. But even when they try to change the law and they argue about it, they send it to the Supreme Correct. Court Justice, right? And there, they're trying to interpret the law, mm -hmm. not to create ones. The Supreme Court does not have the job to Correct. make laws. They have the job to interpret them correctly for the benefit of the nation. Now. You see this book right here, the Mishnah, which everyone goes, ooh, traditions. No, these are the writings of the rulings of the Sanhedrin mm -hmm. Council trying to, try to understand the commandments in different time frames Correct. during their lifetime. But they cannot change the law. Now, the Gemara, which is the opinions. It's like right now Correct. we can have our own opinions. But the moment we quote the scriptures, uh, that's different. That is Correct. concrete, right? Then you're going to have a book that I'm reading from that is just an understanding. But then if we have judges, and if we will have judges, and the judges get together, and they say, okay, guys, this is what the Bible says. This is the context in today where we live without taking mm -hmm. away from the essence of the commandment. Then once that decree is done or that ruling is done, then we'll be com uh, com Correct. talking about it. We can have opinions about it. Like, for example, cannabis right now. You know, they made it legal. Whether you like it or not, it's right. legal in some states. There's nothing you can do about it. You got to live with it. Yeah. Just don't do it. You know, just you don't have to do it. But you cannot say it's illegal yep. in that state because according to the law, it is. Now, same-sex same sex marriage to mm -hmm. me is an abomination. But according to the law of the United States, mm -hmm. it's legal 
So I don't do same-sex marriages. That's why I don't do weddings anymore because I don't want to put myself in that situation. Yep. You see what I mean? It's because I'm not going to do them. So therefore, my values reflect the values of the Torah and we try to become the image of God. We, the problem in the systems of religion, Chris, we want to mix God's values with our modern day worldview and the mm -hmm. values of this country. And that's where the disconnect comes in. Correct. That's the disconnect. When we're trying to fit God's plan into our way of life instead of God's way of life into our life. Look, righteousness and justice, uh, honor and shame. Those principles are themes that can be practiced through every generation, in every domain, in every country, in every age time, age period. Helping the needy, the homeless, and the widows is never going to change. That's why you're always mm -hmm. going to have poor people. Now, how you do it in the country that you do is different. But doing righteous things never changes. So the themes, what are the main themes in the Bible? Covenants. It's a relationship of a covenant. Righteousness and justice. Honor and shame. Then the temple, which teaches you the mm -hmm. covenantal nature and the things you need to do to, do to be considered righteous, to do justice, yep. to bring honor. If you don't study the temple, you don't know the protocol. You will not follow the covenant. You're going to be an oppressor, and then you're going to bring shame. And then the name of God is going to be made a spectacle because we're not living according to yeah. his character. That's really how, if we bring it down to the nitty-gritty, Let's return to the temple. I've been saying it. You know me for so long, Chris. And I turn blue in the face sometimes. Temple, temple. People get sick of me sometimes. Temple, temple. If only they understood the importance of the temple. That's why mm -hmm. I'm so adamant about it. Because I see it, how much it's changed my life. It's helped me. You get a lot of criticism. Yeah. But I'm trying to please God, and I'm not trying to please man. You know. Well, we have seen that God's name ha has become a spectacle through uh, how our actions are, and one of the biggest elements that that I believe it, that is also outlined uh, as we're in this season right now, uh, it's the remembrance of the covenant. Well, what was what was one of the ways? Because obviously we don't have the earthly temple right now. So if it was, you know, there would be people coming and going to Jerusalem and all of that. But the temple then was a gathering place that then had specific commanded times that all people were supposed to come back, that the men of the household were supposed to come back three times a year. And we see that in Leviticus as well, that he outlines this, the feast gatherings and the celebrations. And to me, it's important for us to understand that because we've lost that. Most, most people have lost that. I mean, even down to the traditions of America that are not feast gatherings, they're not, they're not even commanded, they're just whatever. The moment you stop doing things, you know, the moment we stop doing the 4th of July in this country, we see a lack of, of patriotism for those who have gone before us. Well, guess what? what's happened? We stopped doing the feasts. The, the tribes that were dispersed that are out there, the people who are out there that are believers, we stopped doing the feast. We, we don't do the feast cycle. It's a commandment. It is, it is a part yeah. of the structure of the nation of the identity. And why did he do it? Why did he give us multiple ones? Well, there's many reasons for that, just like there's many reasons why he had to give us the temple. But one of the biggest elements of all of these things is to remember the covenant. We can't forget the Amen. covenant. And for God to allow in a cyclical pattern so that we don't disengage from God, forget what he's done, and then lose our identity as believers in Messiah Yeshua in the kingdom right. of God. This is right. huge, people. This is why, as, as much as I know that I, I catch a lot of, lot of junk for it, and I don't care what, what congregation, what church, what fellowship, what home study you do it in, it's so important for us to, to gather on the Sabbath. And the reason why it's important for us to gather on the Sabbath is because if we can't make it, even if it's just one other family in your living room, if we can't make the, the weekly set-apart time, to focus on God and to physically practice a spiritual element of a commandment he's given us, then it's very easy for us to forget about Pesach, about unleavened bread, right. first fruit, uh, Shavuot, Pentecost, uh, the Day of Atonement, the Yom Teruah, and then Tabernacles. It's, it's, it's very, yeah. very easy for us to forget. Well, once you start forgetting all of them, then you forget about God. And then it's you're true. in a bad place. It's, it, it, that's a hundred percent because remember I, I opened the the, um, the study with the book of Leviticus 
all of our values. Mm -hmm. So in the last few, in the last 40 years, what, what have we had in this country? Uh, when was the last time the Pledge of Allegiance was told in the schools? Mm -hmm. Yep. When was the last time people put emphasis on family during the most important times of the year? I mean, there's no longer a community aspect. Everyone's an individual. This is Correct. why the government says, don't go out because we want to save your life from the virus. And all the kids that go to the beach and they don't really care. In other words, I don't really care. I'm going to live life as is today. So you don't really care your, your fellow citizen because you may, contag uh, you, know, you may be contagious and then somebody else will, uh, will die. Mm -hmm. that's, that's like murder, really. Knowingly that you, knowing that you can expose yourself and still be willing to do it because you don't care about anybody else. That is called an individualistic mentality. Correct. The Torah is not about the individual, and that's what we forget. The Torah is about the community as a whole. Correct. And, for example, if we don't say the Shema, if we don't say the weekly Torah portion, we're going to lose our values. Mm -hmm. And, by the way, every congregation, I travel over 23 countries, Chris, and you know that I've been doing this a long time. And every congregation that I've been to that always falls in chaos, there are two things in common. One, they don't study the temple. Mm -hmm. Two, they, they, they don't study the weekly Torah portions. Because if you don't study the weekly Torah portions, how are you going to learn your values? Correct. What did the congregation in Acts 15 told Paul and Barnabas to do when they went with that letter? It says, we tell them not to bother those who are turning to God, but only show them this in the beginning. Abstain from this, from this, from this. He says, for Moses is preached every Sabbath yep. all over the place. In other words, you need to be discipled. Yep. So therefore, the Torah is what teaches you what are the values of God, mm -hmm. when to meet with Him, what is holy, what is not holy. If you make a mistake, how to fix it. So now, it gives us an example. I messed up, Lord. Man, I, I am so sorry, oh Lord. I love you so much. I messed up. I, don't make excuses. Says, I messed up. I defiled your temple. Okay? So now he says... Uh, okay, you want to come before me? Let me give you the prescription uh, to that problem. And he gives you the outline in the book of Leviticus exactly how to come to mm -hmm. him. If you do it with a pure heart and you bring your best to the Lord, man, that is a sweet aroma to the Lord. You can go home psychologically knowing that you're good. Mm -hmm. Your mind is at rest knowing that you, forget, you ask for forgiveness. He's merciful and kind and grateful and graceful. So therefore you go home. So... How do we know nowadays how to fix issues with one another? We don't study the temple, so we don't mm -hmm. know. So therefore, it affects every aspect of our communities. Look, now people disagree with one another. They run off to another congregation. Correct. I've been around Jewish people for the last 15, what, 15 years now. And I talk with rabbis all the time. And it's interesting having conversations with them. We can talk and disagree and disagree. The next day they see you. Hey, how you doing, Rico? How's it going? Are you doing? Are you good? Knowing that we have some extremely uh, big differences. Mm -hmm. I believe in Yeshua with my whole heart. They don't believe in Yeshua. But yet, we can sit down and talk about all the types of topics and agree. And then they still respect me even though I believe in Messiah. Yeah. Because they're mature enough to understand that they're all the values that we hold together. They're always surprised I do the Shema, mm -hmm. I do the feast, I teach about the temple, I quote Leviticus. But there are brothers and Messiah that they're not that tolerant. No. There's no maturity. They're, therefore, if I disagree with you or you do this and I do it this way, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Well, guess what? That is called theological thinking and that is called deno denominationalism. And we need to get away from that. The book of Leviticus, it points you to, hey, it's not about you right yep. now. It's all about being good standing with God. Let me tell you how you, and the priest allows you the honor to come to the Lord. The Lord says, well, you don't know how to do it. Not a problem. Hey, uh, Aaron, your kids, come over here. I'm going to select you. You are in charge of making sure. Now think about this. We never think about it like this. I, do, I, I, I ask a whole bunch of questions every time I study. So think about this, Chris. You make a mistake, and now you're afraid of this God. You see the cloud. You see what he did to the Egyptians. And you don't have a way to come to him. And you're afraid. Clearly, you've been a slave your whole life. So now the Lord says, Aaron, you kids, come over here. All right, guys, listen. This is your job. I want you to prepare yourself to be holy, mm -hmm. to be morally upright, to manipulate the blood the right way, so that this guy over here, this Israelite, can be at ease knowing that I will accept his offering. 
Now think about the love of God that he sets up a whole clan of people, the whole tribe for the sole purpose to serve you. And then he tells the people, all you need to do now, Israel, you don't have to worry about approaching me. You do it the right way and you're morally upright. They'll take care of the ritual. You need to now take care of them. Be reciprocal. Bring your offerings. I'm not going to eat them, the Lord says. I want you to give the offerings and the first fruits and your tithe to them so that now they can live according to their job so that they can minister to you. It creates a circle of mm -hmm. grace. Yep. Now the system of religion and leaders, they abuse that. They don't take care of the people by ministering to them, but they want the people to take care mm -hmm. of them. And the people they want now, they come to the Torah, they don't want to take care of the teachers, mm -hmm. right? Because now they know everything. So we have a disconnect. Yep. Why? Because we don't study well, Leviticus. <sighs> if we would yep. study Leviticus, we will know how significant that, this that's is. That's an overarching element that, you know, I'm glad you brought up because... You know, you look at, at that just as much as God went and said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set aside this whole tribe of people to do this, and you guys take care of them. Uh, they did. They did. You, you, you see people talk about not wanting structure or there's the abuse of power from the pulpit or whatever. And, and let's be honest, we, we paint with a lot of broad brushes in, in our modern culture, but it doesn't matter who's going to set up whatever, whether it's God-ordained or not. The, the first reaction by the overwhelming majority of people is actually like, no, 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 who are you to set it up? Like, ah, you can't set it up. We, we don't want structure. We don't want order. We don't want authority. We don't right. want any of that. And that's the problem because we cannot cast stones on any nations, on any other religious beliefs, on any other practices until we first look in our homes in our groupings of people, the children of God who profess to keep these things, who study these books, who talk about the temple, who look forward to the rebuilding of That's the right. temple. It's That's important. Right. This is one of the most key elements that I think people need Amen. to understand. You know, I, I'm a pastor Amen. of a church. I don't make a single penny off my church. Uh, the Lord has provided a way for me to not have mm -hmm. to do that. But there's a lot of people out there who are very much serving in right. the line the line of the, the priesthood for their grouping, whether it's a community or it's nationally or internationally. They're, they're operating in that role, and a lot of people respect them. Your goal should not be to go out and tear those people down. Your goal should be to support those people. Yeah. Our goal should be to get back to teaching the proper way, not considering that basically we're going to have the Quora mentality and we're going to create our own thing or we're going to create our own cat right. or we're going to create our own culture or we're going to create our own pagan culture, whatever it is. At the end of the day, Leviticus is very, very clear. Yeah. If we really want to get back well, to the order of God, we actually have to obey the order of God. Duh. Amen. Amen. I, what, what did Ephraim do? Mm -hmm. Think about this. What did the house of Israel do? That caused them the dispersion. They changed the feast. They changed the location of the temple. They changed the priesthood. That's exactly what's going on today. Because they don't want any direction. And that's the reality. Now, my, my final point will be this. I think the book of Leviticus and the book of Exodus clearly tells us. He says, okay, the Lord says, these are my ways. You are my people. Your job is to, consider, to keep yourself morally and also ritually pure. Okay, morally, more importantly than ritual, when there's no temple, if there's a temple, then you got to do both when you go to Jerusalem, okay? And then he says, and I want to facilitate for you the people who will help you approach me, okay? The problem is that now anyone can get on YouTube and anyone now can be a teacher of the Torah and you don't know mm. their family, yep. you don't know their lifestyle, you don't know them personally, and you don't know whether or not they even have any relationship with anybody. And you don't even know who their teacher is. Listen, if you know anything about me, you know who I study with, you know every resource that I study, you know where I've come from. If you go with me to Israel, you get to meet my wife and my son. You get to know my older boy when, you, when he's around too. You get to good know kids. my family. So therefore, we have to be careful. Huh? They're good kids. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, we have to... Pick teachers who first have it. Why do I respect you? Because 
Do you and I agree on everything? No, Chris, you're one of my best no. friends in the world. We don't agree on everything, but we're still brothers in Messiah, and we still yep. uh, talk all the time, and we still agree on the big picture, the little things. Hey, we're still going to, you know, see it as we go along in our walk, and the Lord will teach us our lessons. You know, this is part of growing. But I know your yep. wife. I know your kids, bro. I've seen them grow. I mean, so therefore, I can vouch for who you are as a person, as a husband, as a father, you know, and now and I respect you because of that more so than being a pastor of a congregation because anybody can call themselves a pastor and be a lousy True. husband and father and, a, you know, and a, and a person. You see what I mean? Correct. So we need to reevaluate how and to whom we listen to. The day I stop living mm -hmm. according to the principles that God called me to live by, find somebody else to listen to. You know, because I have a responsibility. And this is the essence of the book of Leviticus. God gives Israel with the instructions. You are now accountable and responsible to behave with maturity. Now think on that. Yeah. The Lord says, I know this is my glory on my temple and my tabernacle. I'm going to give you access to come near me. But it's up to you to be accountable and responsible to what you can control. If you do what I asked... And I'm going to give you the instructions. Oh, you're too, glo you're too magnificent to behold. Yes. You are too holy to be in your presence. Yes. And still God says, come, come, let us reason together. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. Why would the God of Israel want to reason with us? And he gives you the instructions. He facilitates for people to help you. He gives you the directions as to exactly what to do so that we can have fellowship with him, so that he can dwell among us. So that's why when people say, oh, I am the temple of the yeah. spirit of God, but I love my pork shop, I struggle with that. Because yeah. how can you call yourself the temple of God and then put in your body something that in the temple of God was, was an abomination. You see what I mean? There's a disconnect. And hopefully, we'll do a good job to bring it forward. Thank you, Chris, man, for having me here, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for coming on. And I 100% agree with you. You know, we really do need to take a look at, at our, our lives, not only as individuals, but as a collective group of people and see, are we really aligning our standards with the holiness yeah. that God has laid out in the Torah? Um, with the precepts that then Yeshua himself put into play for us to interpret Amen. those elements. If we don't take a serious look during this season right now, if we don't take a serious look at, at our own individual hearts, our own community's hearts, uh, we're in deep trouble because we are in the season leading up to Pesach where our only hope our only hope to overcome plagues, our only hope to overcome pestilence, our only hope to be set free from whatever the slavery and bondage is that we have in our hearts and in our lives has already been foretold at this very season with the story of the Exodus and passing over of the children of Israel. If we are not going to put mm -hmm. the blood on our doorpost, not literally, don't go out and, and put blood on your doorpost, but if we're not going to take the temple in our homes as a community and as individuals, and we're not going to cover ourselves with that and realign with the standards of holiness of the Lord, we're in a lot of trouble. And, and the judgment that we see around Amen. us is only just begun. And the Lord will use that judgment for however long is necessary to restore the order to his perfect creation. And so Rico, thank you uh, as always uh, for being on. Thank you to Yolanda for allowing him to be with us and uh, Tito for helping to make this happen. Um, let's go ahead and close in, in a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Dear Adonai, we... Sure, sure. Thank you for having me. It's always... Amen. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Love having you, man. No, I was going to say thank you for having me, Chris. I really, I really appreciate you, and I hope that everything we do will be pleasing to the Lord and yeah. edifying to the body of Messiah. So thank you for having me. Shabbat shalom, and go ahead, brother. Finish up there. All right. Dear Adam and I, we just thank you for this, this time and this conversation and this study of your word. Father, we, uh, we come together at this time on this holy day, and we just praise you. 
We praise you for, for the words and instructions that you have given to our forefathers and the fact that throughout all of the chaos of, of the centuries that have happened, that you have kept these words alive. Father, I thank you that by the power of your Holy Spirit right now, you are calling people out. You are calling people back to your word to study your temple, to study your ways, to know your heart, your righteousness, and your justice for all. Father, I thank you for, for the Cortez family, for Rico, for Wisdom and Torah Ministries. And Father, I just uh, pray today that uh, you would continue to bless his family. You would continue to bless him and his wife, that you would bless his boys, that you would bless the work that he does, Father. I know he loves you. I know he loves Messiah. And the fruit of his labor is, is beautiful. And so, Father, I thank you for, for my friend, for my teacher, and I thank you for the opportunity for us to get to to, uh, to broadcast to the, to the homes around the world today. May you be glorified. May you be lifted up. For you are the one true God of Israel. For it's in Yeshua's amen. name we come before you. Amen and amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.